For nearly 200 years, the Knights of the Temple of Solomon were the epitome of Christianity's medieval crusade against Islam. The Templars had maintained a standing army and had constructed fortifications throughout the Holy Land, all financed by a vast business empire created in Western Europe. But in the year 1291, the Islamic Mamluks of Egypt had finally driven the Templars and all the Crusaders from Palestine. The Templars' entire reason for being was the defense of Christian holy sites. What role could there now be for the warrior monks? If they had no role, why did they still need such wealth? The triumph of Islam over the Christians in the Holy Land was a blow to Western European prestige, but not a total catastrophe. Enthusiasm for major crusades had declined over the last century, as the Christians had suffered defeat after defeat. To many, there must have been some reason why God had seemingly abandoned the Crusaders. The sins of pride, arrogance and avarice were accusations the Templars had faced many times, but the Templars had never once given up the fight against the Muslims. The Grand Master himself had died in their last battle at Acre, and the remaining Templars had all fought to the death. For the order as a whole, the annihilation of the Christian state was merely a temporary setback. The Templars fought very gallantly to defend Acre in 1291, and even though they were driven back on Cyprus in the course of the 1290s, there's plenty of evidence to show that they were continuing to maintain the cause of the crusade. They, they um, hired fleets, they attacked the Egyptian and Syrian mainlands, they attempted to establish a base on the island of Ruad off Tortosa. It was unsuccessful, but the will was there to do it. Neither did the Templars halt their recruiting and fundraising activities. Crusading enthusiasm had dampened in Europe, but had by no means died. The Templars had no difficulty attracting new recruits. An individual's motivation for joining one of the military orders, I am quite sure, was almost entirely religious. So if he succeeded in saving his soul, then from his point of view, he was victorious. The fact that he, would, he had lost a battle, lost a fight, that the Crusader states had fallen was, I won't say secondary, it was a, it was a disaster. But as far as the individual motivation of a recruit is concerned, if he fought and died in the cause that he believed were in, and went to heaven, then he, as an individual, was victorious. With a new headquarters in Cyprus, new recruits, a highly productive network still providing immense funds, the Order of the Temple continued its 200-year-old struggle against Islam. After each catastrophe, the resilient Templars had always regrouped and returned to the fray. of October the 13th, 1307, the officials of Philip the Fair, the King of France, suddenly arrested the Templars in the lands which the King controlled and charged them with a variety of heretical crimes, um, of obscenities, of the worship of an idol. 
and very quickly extracted confessions from many of the Templars that had been arrested at that time. The charges brought against the Templars could not possibly be more serious. They included treason with the Muslims, worshipping an idol, denying Jesus Christ, spitting on the cross, sleeping with the devil, eating the ashes of their dead, impregnating virgins and various homosexual activities. If the Templar Knights were found guilty of any one of these crimes, they would be burned alive. More than 5,000 Templars throughout France had been arrested in a highly coordinated dawn swoop. Even the Grand Master of the Order of the Temple, James of Malay, had been captured and he too had confessed to many of the accusations. Could one of the most respected orders of the church really have been a secret society of devil worshippers? At the same time as the arrest, Philip, the King of France, had seized all the Templar lands and properties and urged the crown heads of Europe to do the same. But not all of them were convinced of the Templars' guilt. Those rulers who were not linked to the French monarchy were, were very, very sceptical, as were many independent commentators, the, the Italians in particular, um, who wrote about it at the time, were quite convinced there was a financial motive behind it. And we have to take their view seriously. Nobody knew more about money than the Italians in the early 14th century. So there was widespread scepticism. Edward II of England, for instance, uh, said that he simply did not believe it, that these had been gallant defenders of the Holy Land and important servants of the English crown, and that he found the whole thing impossible to believe and quite astounding. It was well known that the French crown was in severe financial difficulties. In the preceding years, the king had debased the coinage, expelled the Lombard bankers, and confiscated all properties of the Jews. Philip was exceptionally pious and probably even believed the accusations brought against the Templars. If they were true, it was his duty to purify his realm. The arrest of the Templars, however, was a long-awaited opportunity for the king to assert his dominance over an increasingly weak papacy. One notable aspect of the trial is that the reigning pope, Clement V, wasn't told in advance. So it came as much as a surprise to him as it did to the Templars. And he was very affronted by it. He was perhaps less concerned about the fate of the Templars than he was about his own authority, I think. And therefore, having seen that the, the event had occurred, he was most interested in reasserting his own position vis-a-vis -vis a powerful secular monarch like Philip IV. So he actually tried to take over the trial, having found that he couldn't really reverse it. And this is the reason that the trial spread to other countries, because the Pope ordered a general arrest of the Templars in other countries in order to try to find the truth of the charges that were brought against the order. The intervention of the Pope was what the Templars had been waiting for. All immediately withdrew their damning confessions, as it was a custom of the time for an accused man to confess and later retract when he was back on safe ground. But the Templars were blind to the political realities. Europe was seeing a massive power struggle, nothing less than the birth of a nation state as the King of France attempted to limit the centuries-old political influence of the church in France. Nothing would stand in his way. King Philip was set on destroying the Templars and had launched an enormous public relations offensive, 
circulating the sensational confessions throughout his kingdom. To the people of medieval France and Europe, news of the blasphemous Templar confessions was profoundly shocking. Even today, many people still believe that these confessions must have contained at least a grain of truth. Some historians have actually believed that the Templars were guilty of the crimes of which they were accused, and they point to the large number of confessions that were made, and indeed the great detail that one can see in the confessions of participation in obscene and blasphemous rites, which the Templars were accused of. I think, though, for those of us looking back on the 20th century, a century scarred by governmental pressures, both mental and physical, in particular, a century in which torture has been used extensively by most of the governments of the world, we, I think, can have a good deal less faith in confessions extracted under that kind of pressure. And indeed, most of these Templars were tortured um, in all kinds of horrendous and painful ways. And not one of us could say that we wouldn't be forced to confess almost anything, perhaps anything, if we were put under sufficient pressure. The confessions were damning evidence enough, but following two centuries of suspicion and rumor, they found fertile ground in the minds of many Europeans. The Templars' vast wealth, their failure to defend the Holy Land, their unusual relationship with the Muslims and Islamic culture was enough to convince the Pope that there may be some truth in the allegations. But more importantly for the papacy, its own prestige was at stake. The Pope had seen no option but to abandon the order of the temple. The Templars had few among their ranks who were capable of defending themselves against such abominable charges. The fact that the Templars regarded themselves and were regarded by others as um, unqualified in strictly religious or doctrinal matters was not a problem in the early years, but I suspect that it laid them open to criticism later, or at least was like a chink in their armour. The fact that they had always claimed not to be uh, scholarly in religious matters meant that they could be accused of deviant religious beliefs or activities. And they would find it very, very difficult to justify themselves or to explain this because in the past they had never claimed any knowledge. So, in a sense, their only excuse was ignorance. The trial of the Templars took five years. Midway through, the King of France had 54 Templars burned as relapsed heretics, quickly ending a brief but spirited Templar defense. Finally, in March 1312, five years after the arrest, the Pope announced the abolition of the Order of the Temple of Solomon. All of their vast lands and treasure were handed over to the Knights Hospitaller, much to the fury of the French king. Philip immediately sued the Hospitallers for the legal costs of the trial. All of Europe was stunned. The abolition of the Templars was unprecedented. Many still refused to believe the Templars' guilt, but Europe's crowns could not resist the rich pickings of the Templar properties. In, in England, for instance, Edward II took over the Templar lands and the Templar treasury, and he made assignments on these lands and on these, this money. And although in the long term, once the Templars were suppressed in 1312, the property was transferred to the Hospitallers. We know from Hospitaller records that the order of the Hospital was still trying to get hold of lands that Edward II had assigned to 
political friends and political favourites of his um, in the late 1330s. We know from hospital inventories that that's the case. So once the process had started, it was equally damaging to the temple in those countries where the monarchs had, in the first place, been quite sceptical of their guilt. In the year 1314, the two most senior Templars, the last Grand Master, James of Malay, and Geoffrey of Charnay were burned alive as relapsed heretics. Ordinary knights who confessed and repented were given prison sentences and were then allowed to join other orders. Over nearly 200 years of warfare, 20,000 knights had died fighting Islam. But in the end, it was Christianity itself that destroyed the order of the Temple of Solomon. Today, little remains of the order's empire, ruins of enormous castles, a few remnants of the vast European network, which once owned more than 900 preceptories. However, Modern warfare, trading, shipping, communications, banking, and farming all owe something to the innovations of the Knights Templar. The Templar, the history of the Templars taken overall, is a very neat story of rise and fall, of initial popularity, of initial humility, which turned into overweening power arrogance and avarice, ultimately leading to their trial. In fact, I don't think that that is a very good way of looking at their history. I think that we are far too much influenced by the fact they were brought to trial. All the time, therefore, if one's trying to examine the history of the Templars in the course of the 12th and 13th centuries, one must try to do it without bearing in mind the trial that occurred, to try to think as if the trial never happened and then look at the history of the Templars. And I think one would find it would look rather different because in my view, the trial was not a direct consequence of any actions or omissions that could be laid at the Templars' door in the period from the 1290s onwards. I think that the action against the Templars in the trial was largely generated by circumstances within France, and in particular, circumstances within the Capetian government at that particular time. The story of the Knights Templar does not end with the destruction of the order and the immolation of James of Molay and Geoffrey of Charnay. The dramatic rise and fall of one of the most powerful institutions of the day has fascinated people for the last seven centuries. The fact that they were brought to trial in 1307 and eventually suppressed in 1312 inevitably colours the way that we look at them. And then in turn, the way that they've been written about, in particular, I think, by Sir Walter Scott in the novel Ivanhoe, which was published in 1819, has helped to reinforce the, the, the idea of the arrogant, overconfident, overbearing Templar, who was nevertheless also the possessor of mysterious, esoteric, anti-Christian secrets. Soon after the abolition of the Knights Templar, legends grew up of escaped Templars, secret societies, hidden treasure, mysterious scrolls, and strange connections to some of the world's greatest religious icons. One of the reasons, I think, for the continuing fascination with the Templars is that they have a long after history, which begins almost immediately with, with the burning of James of Molay and Geoffrey of Charnay in Paris as relapsed heretics in 1314. Various chroniclers claimed that Molay had brought a curse down upon the Capetian house and 
in particular upon Philip the Fair, as well as upon Clement V, calling upon the vengeance of God to bring them before the trib tribunal of heaven within the year. And of course, it was easy for them to say this because both Philip the Fair and Clement V did actually die within the year. So one could make it look as if that really did make sense. But that, those, those dramatic ideas that one sees in near contemporary chronicles, chronicles has, have since been embroidered and developed by other people seeking sensationalism, um, seeking a story that continues after the Templar sensational end. In my view, there's no substance in any of these stories, but that doesn't stop them being used by different people in different periods for their own purposes, and this continues right down to, to the present day. One of the most persistent legends associated with the Templars is their connection with the Shroud of Turin, which for many years was believed to have been the burial shroud of Jesus Christ. In the 1970s and 1980s, when historians and scientists were arguing about the authenticity of this particular relic, they needed to provide it, if, if, if it was to be seen as authentic, they needed to provide it with a scientific provenance, but they also needed to provide it with a continuous history. And there, there were really large gaps. One of those gaps was filled, in some people's view, by the idea that it was the Templars who'd held the Turin Shroud, that they'd seized it during the Fourth Crusade sack of Constantinople in 1204, that they'd kept it secret among their treasures throughout the 13th century, that that was the origin of the accusation that they worshipped idols, that they'd made many copies of it and it had been the subject of a cult within the order, and that before the Templars were finally suppressed, they had managed to smuggle it away into the possession of the Shane family, who were the ones who exhibited it in the late, eight, late 14th century, um, when it seems to reappear again. So this seemed like a plausible theory as to what had happened to the Shroud in the 13th and the 14th centuries, while also rather neatly explaining the accusation of idol worship against the Templars. The problem with the theory is that there's not one shred of evidence to support it. It is entirely a theory and it's totally incredible and quite unbelievable. The legend of the Order of the Temple of Solomon lives on through the activities of thousands of modern Templar societies all over the world. Many have charitable aims, and some claim an unbroken link to the last Templars. But it is the Order's role in the Freemasonry movement that has done most to give the Templars worldwide recognition. I don't think that for the rest of the medieval period, and really very much into the 16th and 17th centuries, there's massive interest in the Templars. Where it really revives is in the 18th century with the growth of Masonic orders, who liked to believe that they were directly linked to the Temple of Solomon and to the Masons who had supposedly built the Temple of Solomon. And in this sense, they looked towards a provenance associated with institutions that had lived in those buildings on the Temple Mount, which the Crusaders had thought had actually been the Temple of Solomon. And of course, they lighted upon the Templars as part of that early history. Given that, that these Masonic orders also sought a provenance for themselves, as most new institutions do, it seemed logical to see the Templars as being part of that system of esoteric ideas and secret ideas which they liked to believe that they were guardians of, um, and which they might have believed were suppressed by the 
regime of Philip the Fair and the papal monarchy as represented by Clement V. So I think that the real, real revival in Templar interest comes as a consequence of the Masons, particularly the German Masons, from about the 1760s onwards. Many of the Templar legends begin with the Order's occupation of the Temple platform in Jerusalem. And some people believe the Templar Knights must have excavated beneath the platform. Here, the Templars are supposed to have found at one time or another not just the esoteric secrets of King Solomon himself, but even the Ark of the Covenant. But there are several problems with these theories. Uh, the Crusaders actually called it Solomon's Stable. And uh, really, although this name has no base from architecture or historical point of view, because that site, as it is stand today, has nothing to do with Prophet Solomon's. We know that Solomon's developed Jerusalem, but not that site or that area exactly. Although the structure as it is stand today, especially the bases are Roman, while the upper courses is purely Islamic and from the Umayyad dynasty. One Templar legend is that their vast treasure, together with any esoteric secrets they may or may not have discovered, escaped the clutches of the French king. For decades, the discovery of the lost Templar gold and the lost secrets have been the ambition of many a treasure seeker. Rosalind Chapel in Scotland, which is the heart of Scottish Freemasonry, is also believed by many to hold those Templar treasures which must have eluded the King of France. When the Templars were arrested in 1307, the officials of Philip the Fair very carefully inventoried all their possessions and they also took over the Temple Fortress and Bank to the north of Paris. So it seems very unlikely that any substantial part of the Templar possessions was missed by these people. Um, I don't think there's any secret treasure. I think it's much more mundane and straightforward than that. I think simply that the officials of Philip the Fair took over the Templar possessions that they could lay their hands on, which was most of what the Templars possessed in France. The legend of the Knights Templar expands every year as new theories are published, each seeking to prove conclusively that the Templars really are connected to history's most famous names and places. At one time or another, the Templars have been associated with not just the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail, but even the discovery of America a century before Columbus.